Amber didn't press Darren for more details. The look in his eyes told her everything she needed to know. She was the one Darren loved now. The past didn't matter. Isabella's unexpected arrival didn't create a rift between them. Instead, they embraced each other warmly and fell asleep. The next morning, Amber's stomach growled, pulling her out of her slumber earlier than usual. She freshened up and followed the aroma of breakfast as she descended the stairs. Entering the dining room, Uncle Will's face brightened when he saw her. Good morning, madam, he said. She tilted her head in confusion and replied, What's up, Uncle Will? As she asked, her gaze shifted, landing on a familiar figure bustling in the kitchen, Isabella. Meanwhile, Isabella thought it was Darren coming down the stairs. She was eagerly preparing a bowl of porridge. Darren, I made breakfast for you, your favorite, she announced proudly. Upon seeing Amber, her enthusiasm dampened instantly, the smile slipping from her face. However, Amber responded with a bright grin, cheerily announcing, Uncle Will, I'm starving. Relieved by Amber's calm demeanor, Uncle Will whispered, Madam, should I ask her to leave? Amber waved a dismissive hand. We should show hospitality. Besides, she's already made breakfast. Although she was polite, her thoughts were clear. Isabella had the audacity to seek out Darren on their wedding night. It was only fair that she kept a close eye on her. Taking a seat at the table, Uncle Will began serving the dishes Isabella had prepared. As Amber settled in, Isabella's eyes darted up the staircase, her expression a mix of anxiety and longing. Where was Darren? Had he overslept? She wondered. Smells amazing. Amber's eyes fixed on the bowl in Isabella's grasp. Inside was the mushroom and meat porridge that Isabella had painstakingly prepared that morning, alongside Darren's favorite milk bread. Uncle Will, can you hand me that? Amber requested, nodding towards the bowl. Without hesitation, Uncle Will took the bowl from Isabella. She could only watch. Her resistance was futile. Amber sampled the porridge. The flavors exceeded her expectations. It was superior to anything she'd ever ordered out. Who knew Isabella had such culinary talent? Comparing her own limited cooking skills to Isabella's prowess, Amber felt slightly inadequate. Darren? Isabella's voice quivered, witnessing Amber enjoy the meal she'd made with such care. Her hands tightened into fists, but she refrained from making any moves towards the bowl. She knew that causing a scene would only tarnish her image in Darren's eyes. Instead, she hoped playing the part of the victim might elicit some sympathy. Amber put down her spoon after a few bites. It might be tasty, but it was made by someone trying to steal her husband. There was only so much she could stomach. He was pretty worn out last night. He's still resting, she responded, emphasizing the word worn out with a playful smirk. It was our wedding night. So? She added, grinning. Isabella's cheeks reddened, a mix of embarrassment and frustration at Amber's implications. With feigned nonchalance, she remarked, You're only twenty, aren't you, Miss Amber? Yes, a full decade younger than you, Amber chuckled. The age and beauty comparison was evident, and it wasn't lost on Isabella, who visibly bristled at the comment. Miss Amber, for someone so young, you sure don't have a filter, she shot back. Her vexed expression was a far cry from the tearful one she had worn in front of Darren the previous night. Amber was familiar with women playing the innocent card, and she wasn't phased. When it came to these women, tactics and audacity were one thing, but what mattered most was the man at the center of it all. If she were dealing with someone like Carlos, he'd easily be swayed by a damsel act. Amber was grateful that her partner was Darren, a man who was fully committed to her and who'd always consider her perspective as valid. What's the matter? You lost your nerve? Amber teased, adding with a chuckle, You think it's inappropriate for my husband and me to be close? Her grin faded as she continued. If being intimate with one's spouse is deemed audacious, it makes me wonder what you think about pursuing someone else's man. 
Isabella was taken aback by Amber's words. She had dug up information on Amber and deliberately encountered her at the bar last time. She believed Amber, being under 20, was just young and vibrant. Knowing that Amber's mother passed away early on and her stepmother, Shannon, wasn't kind, Isabella assumed Amber was somewhat vulnerable. She expected Darren's chosen one to mirror her own character. Now, as she clashed with Amber, Isabella was realizing she had underestimated her. By the way, Miss Isabella, I prefer to be addressed as Mrs. Fleming, Amber corrected with a smirk. Her use of Mrs. Fleming irked Isabella. You haven't gotten any official commitment from Darren, Isabella retorted, her irritation clear as she dropped the polite Miss Amber. Amber was enjoying her breakfast. She looked up and quipped, neither have you received any sort of endorsement from him. Isabella's smile vanished, replaced by a disgruntled expression. So, she asked. He's already my husband, Amber declared. Amber, things can change, Isabella teased. The only reason Darren married you is because I wasn't around. Amber took in Isabella's self-assured demeanor and thought to herself how different things might have been if she'd been born a decade earlier. Really? She responded with a hint of sarcasm. I mentioned to Darren last night that he always had poor judgment. Isabella's attention was immediately captured, curious about Darren's reaction to such a comment. And what did he say? She asked. He remarked that youth often leads to misguided decisions. But ever since he met me, his choices have only gotten better, Amber replied coolly. Isabella couldn't ignore the mocking undertone in Amber's voice or the implication of Darren's words. That can't be true. Heartache was evident in her voice, Isabella countered, refusing to accept the notion. Did Darren genuinely regret their past? She wondered. Miss Isabella, you might be onto something. There's a lot that can happen in a year, Amber said, her smile returning but by the time we make it official, we might already have started our family. For Amber, the fact remained the same. Darren was hers. Isabella's resentment grew with every boastful word from Amber. You know, if I were pregnant, my looks would change, Isabella remarked, alluding to Amber potentially being expectant during their official ceremony next year. It's a shame to think of wedding pictures with a baby bump. Why not capture the moments while you still look good? She quipped. But even if I looked different, I'd still be younger than you, Amber countered. Even if there was an age gap between her and Darren, she was certainly younger than Isabella. Isabella couldn't miss the teasing undertone in Amber's words. Amber consistently emphasized her youth, poking fun at her age. Amber! Isabella's voice trembled with anger. Darren isn't shallow. A glint appeared in Amber's eyes as she spotted someone on the stairway. Honey, did you just get up? She called out, a smile forming on her lips. Isabella's ears caught the soft thud of footsteps descending. Any trace of anger vanished from her face, replaced by a practiced smile. She had applied makeup that morning, meticulously covering the bruises, but with so much foundation layered on, could she ever match Amber's natural beauty? Hope colored her voice as she looked in his direction. Darren, she called out lovingly. Having overheard Amber's comments from upstairs, Darren already had an inkling about the tension in the room. He knew that Amber was fuming, especially if she had suggested keeping Isabella at arm's length. She was never one to easily forget a grudge, and Darren admired that tenacity in her. Still, Isabella was a part of his past, and though their paths had diverged, he wasn't entirely indifferent to her. But her attempts to unsettle his current life angered him. No past romance could hold a candle to the joy Amber brought him. Without acknowledging Isabella, Darren walked to the dining table, seating himself beside Amber. Tears welled up in Isabella's eyes as she watched him bypass her. Darren, she whispered. Amber eyed Isabella's teary display, puzzled by the common trend of women turning on the waterworks in front of men. 
but Darren remained unfazed, making Isabella's tears flow freely. Isabella watched as Darren and Amber engaged in hushed conversation. This couldn't be real. Maybe Darren was just upset about her past mistakes, using his marriage to Amber as a means to rile her up. She couldn't bear to think that he'd moved on, that there was no lingering emotion for her in his heart. Hubby, I think Miss Isabella wants your attention, Amber said with a hint of amusement. She was determined to ensure Isabella understood her place and wouldn't interfere with her marriage. Darren glanced over at the teary-eyed Isabella, noticing how different she seemed from the girl he remembered. Sweetie, this is the breakfast Isabella made for you. Give it a try, Amber said, placing a bowl of mushroom and meat porridge in front of Darren. The rich aroma wafted from the bowl, making Amber's mouth water. Why does Isabella have to be such a good cook? She wondered. Noticing the way Amber's eyes lit up at the scent, Darren could tell she was tempted. He also gathered why she wanted him to sample what Isabella had prepared. When he reached for the bowl, Isabella's crying ceased. She held her breath, eagerly watching his reaction. Having had to fend for herself and her mother from a young age, Isabella prided herself on her culinary prowess. Darren had once complimented her noodles a decade ago, and she hoped this porridge would impress him just as much. She was certain he'd love the dish, even though Amber had already eaten a portion of it. But Darren's reaction wasn't what she had anticipated. He set down the bowl, and both women anxiously awaited his feedback. Darren caught Amber's slightly threatening glare, realizing she wanted him to exaggerate his response, possibly to unsettle Isabella. It's good, he admitted, subtly intertwining his fingers with Amber's under the table. Amber's face fell momentarily. Why did he have to be so honest? However, catching a playful smirk on Darren's face and the warmth in his gaze, her annoyance faded. She was momentarily taken aback. Even if Darren wasn't siding with her against Isabella, he surely knew how to charm her early in the day. Amber felt a surge of annoyance as she noticed the lingering gaze between Darren and Isabella. Everything my wife tries turns out pretty good, Darren remarked with a smile, trying to lighten the mood. His casual and affectionate tone emphasized their marital bond, making everyone feel the warmth of their relationship. Isabella's heart ached and she couldn't shake the feeling that Darren was deliberately using Amber to get under her skin. Yes, Amber agreed with a grin. No matter how the dish might be, it always ends up tasting wonderful, Darren said, accepting a plate from a nearby server. It was clear to him that Isabella was an outsider here, while Amber was his partner in every sense. Amber smirked, glancing at the mushroom meat porridge. I couldn't agree more, she said. With that, she decisively dumped the bowl of porridge into the trash. It's just not appealing to look at, she quipped. Uncle Will was ever observant and quickly cleared away the rest of Isabella's breakfast, placing it in the trash as well. Distraught at seeing her morning efforts dismissed so carelessly, Isabella tried to interject, but her protests fell on deaf ears. Miss Amber, how could you? Even if you didn't like what I prepared, you had no right to just toss it away, she exclaimed as frustration was evident in her tone. This is my home, Amber responded coolly. She locked eyes with a fuming Isabella and added, Miss Isabella, I believe I asked you to refer to me as Mrs. Fleming. Turning her gaze to Darren, she sought his agreement. Isn't that right, Mr. Fleming? Darren's gentle smile caused Isabella's heart to race, her fists tightening in response. Indeed, Mrs. Fleming, he agreed. Amber beamed, pleased that Darren sided with her. But when she looked at Isabella, the usual sorrowful tears were absent. Instead, determination shone in Isabella's eyes. Actions might lie, but one's true feelings always peeked through their gaze. It was evident to Isabella that Darren's affection for Amber was genuine. Uncle Will, please escort Miss Isabella out, 
Amber said curtly, emphasizing the unspoken message. She wasn't welcome in the Fleming residence anymore. Isabella's focus was solely on Darren. Her anxious eyes sought some sign, some hint of his true feelings. Did he really not care for her anymore? She wondered. Darren finished his meal, wiped his mouth, and finally broke the tense silence. I'll see her out, he declared. Amber paused, then replied, Okay. A mixture of relief and hope coursed through Isabella. Did Darren's willingness to escort her signify some lingering affection for her? She cast him an expectant look, a tentative smile forming. Catching the interaction, Amber stood and said, Hubby, take care, return soon. If there was truly nothing between Darren and Isabella, why personally see her out? Amber surmised Darren must have something important to convey. I'll be quick. Once I'm back, we'll head over to my parents, he replied. Sounds good, Amber said, her eyes locking with Darren's, filled with love. Being near the one you adore naturally evokes a smile and the longing for a tender touch. Darren felt the pull of affection. He leaned down and, before Amber could react, pressed a soft kiss to her cheek. Then, wrapping an arm around her waist, he kissed her again, moving from her cheek to her lips. The affectionate display left Amber slightly flushed. Way to go, Darren exclaimed softly smiling at Amber's flushed face, finding it difficult to pull himself away from her. They exchanged tender glances, their reluctance to part evident. Amidst their exchange, Isabella's expression hardened. Her fists clenched as she followed Darren out of the Fleming home with a pale face. After they left, Uncle Will asked Amber with a playful twinkle in his eyes, aren't you worried about Mr. Darren's past resurfacing? Kneeling and playing with their dog, Duke, Amber looked up and laughed. Uncle Will, I trust Darren completely. Her trust in Darren was deep-rooted. She had faith in their bond and his integrity. In the sleek car, Darren and Isabella sat side by side while Uncle Will had arranged for a driver to take them. Although Uncle Will was silently hopeful Darren wouldn't make a mistake and hurt Amber, Darren's intentions were much clearer to him. Inside the vehicle, Isabella broke the ice, glancing at Darren as he took a drag from his cigarette. You used to smoke back in the day too. Seems like that habit's only grown stronger. Darren merely responded with a nonchalant, yep. Where's your place? He asked. With a self-deprecating chuckle, Isabella confessed, I don't really have anywhere to go. My mother passed away a few years back. I've lost touch with my roots in Michigan. I'm not even sure where to call home now. She had come back to Michigan and had been staying at a place arranged by Julie. Feeling cornered, she tried to rebuild her relationship with Darren. She had made her way to the Fleming residence the previous evening, intentionally drenching herself in the rain to invoke some sympathy, hoping that he would take pity and let her stay. But... His cold demeanor took her by surprise, as did Amber's unexpected hospitality. It was Amber, after all, who had offered her shelter for the night. Isabella understood Amber's reasoning for allowing her to stay at the Fleming residence. I'm sorry for intruding last night, Isabella remarked with a hint of sorrow in her voice. Her attempts to pry and influence had reached their limit. She couldn't fool herself any longer. I just wanted to check on you and Amber. I never meant to disrupt your lives. The breakfast I made today might be the last meal I ever prepare for you, she admitted. But she saw through it, Darren noted, catching the undercurrent in Isabella's words. Facing her melancholic smile, he stated plainly, Isabella, Amber is my wife now. It's been a decade since our chapter closed. He felt the urgency to clarify things with Isabella. He didn't want to continually fend her off, especially with Amber around. I get it, Isabella responded, tears streaming down her cheeks. For ten long years, you were always on my mind. It wasn't by choice that I didn't come back. Julie played her part, she continued, eyes brimming with regret, 
thinking of how Julie's interference had derailed her life's path. Had it not been for Julie's meddling, she might have been in Amber's place, sharing a life with Darren. Isabella, I'm not here to rehash the past, Darren interjected coolly, taking a drag from his cigarette. What's done is done. You need to focus on your present, he remarked. The present? Isabella echoed with a melancholic laugh. If my present was any good, I wouldn't have shamelessly intruded on your wedding night, trying to sabotage your relationship. I've been lost without you, she confessed. Tears were still streaming down. As she tried to grasp Darren's hand for some semblance of comfort, he swiftly pulled away. He was clear about his boundaries. The sight of Isabella's desperation didn't sway him. He was certain about who held his heart. Isabella, Darren declared. His gaze was firm on her face. You know me well enough. If someone goes after those I care about, I'll decide how to handle it. His words bore an implicit warning, signaling to Isabella not to harbor any intentions toward Amber. Isabella hoped his decision to personally escort her away signaled some residual feelings for her, but with his latest remarks, she grasped that he was acting out of concern for Amber. You think I'd harm Amber? She questioned, her tone edged with disbelief. Or could it be Amber fears that sparks from our past might reignite and threaten her position? She probed further. Amber isn't someone you can push around, Darren retorted, his eyes coldly assessing Isabella. She's beyond your reach. Isabella was taken aback. She hadn't anticipated Darren's fierce protectiveness over Amber. Amber doesn't need to be vulnerable or soft for others to target her. She has her own strengths, and where she lacks, I'll provide. I hope I've made myself clear, Isabella, Darren asserted. So Amber can throw her weight around, but I'm forbidden to challenge her? Isabella remarked sarcastically, noting just how far Darren would go to shield Amber. Why, Darren? She demanded, frustration clear in her voice. When I left you, it wasn't by choice. I deserve an explanation, don't I? I sent you a letter before your wedding, detailing everything from back then. Did you even see it? Or did Amber keep it from you? Her voice grew increasingly emotional as the weight of her return, only to find Darren's affections elsewhere, bore down on her. No more excuses. Let me be clear, Isabella. I love Amber, Darren interrupted coldly. Is it because she's younger and more radiant than I am? Isabel spat out bitterly. Men always seem to gravitate towards fresh, youthful beauty, she thought. Darren couldn't deny it. He recognized Amber's youth and beauty. But his feelings for her were more profound than just superficial attractions. I love every aspect of her, he asserted, emphasizing things other than youth and beauty. Isabella felt the sting of his words and clutched her dress in a tight grip. If Amber wasn't in the picture, would we have had a chance? She asked, searching for some vestige of hope. Exhaling the last of his cigarette, Darren responded resolutely. No, now that you have asked that, he paused, choosing his words carefully. Even without Amber, I wouldn't be with you. Over the last decade, even after feeling betrayed by Isabella, he hadn't sought another romantic partner. Being the sole heir to the Flemings, he felt an immense responsibility to protect his family's legacy. He wanted to provide them with a shield against any adversities. From a young age, his parents shielded him. Now it was his turn to shield them. As a result, he had been so engrossed in his work that he'd sidelined his personal life. Perhaps, he mused, he'd been waiting for someone like Amber. Isabella struggled to hold back tears. Coming to the Fleming residence the previous night seemed futile now, understanding that Darren's affections were no longer hers. What was she to do next? To Julie, she was now deemed worthless as well. Resigned to her fate and overwhelmed by the weight of her feelings for Darren, she felt defeated. Darren sensed her distress and reached into his pocket and handed her a check. I know life's been tough on you. This should help, he said. To him, the amount on the check, 
$200,000 was a drop in the bucket, but to Isabella, it might make a world of difference. As Isabel examined the check, Darren added with a hint of sternness, I hope you won't interfere with Amber and my life anymore. The glimmer of hope that had momentarily appeared on Isabella's face quickly dimmed. She cried as the reality of the situation sunk in. Maybe I was too presumptuous, she said, laughing bitterly at herself, believing that if I returned and explained everything, it would change the past. Guess I was just deluding myself. Darren, you don't love me anymore, she lamented. Darren chose not to reply and noticed a bus stop ahead. He instructed the driver to pull over. You can catch a bus to wherever you want to go, he said. His tone was indifferent, indicating it was time for her to leave. Isabella stared at Darren's stoic face, contrasting it with the warm smiles she had seen him share with Amber. A pang of sorrow shot through her heart. Instead of the expected pleas and tears, she managed a smile. Darren, take care, she said softly. I truly hope you find happiness. With those words, she opened the car door and stepped out. As her feet touched the pavement, the car sped away, leaving her behind. Isabella gazed after the retreating vehicle, a bittersweet smile dancing on her lips even as tears welled up in her eyes. He's been so cold to me, she lamented silently. She approached the nearby bus stop and stashed the check from Darren into her purse. Pulling out her phone, she dialed Julie's number. He pushed me away, she admitted. Julie, on the other end, didn't seem surprised, as though she had anticipated this result. I put on quite the performance and shed genuine tears, but Darren remained unmoved, Isabella remarked, her voice detached. It had all been a ploy orchestrated by Julie, from Darren's supposed abduction of Isabella to the scene at the Fleming residence. Are you going back or are you staying in Michigan? Julie inquired. Isabella's lips curled up in a faint smile. Julie was well aware that Isabella dreaded returning to what she once called home. Michigan, Isabel replied shortly, ending the call. She settled on the bus bench, awaiting the Geller family's car. Darren had made it clear she should steer clear of him and Amber. But how could she just fade away when he was leading such a charmed life while hers felt like a living nightmare? If he didn't care for her, then no one should be at peace, she thought. Meanwhile, Amber had changed into fresh clothes by the time Darren returned home. Spotting him, she strode forward, her face lighting up with a radiant smile. Hubby, she cooed playfully standing on her tiptoes to plant a kiss on his lips. His earlier kiss had sent her heart racing, and now it was her turn to leave him flustered. Darren pulled Amber into a tight embrace and returned her kiss with such fervor that it left them both momentarily breathless. Okay, time out, Amber giggled, pulling back slightly to catch her breath. Amber, if she tries to bother you again, let me know. Darren playfully tapped her nose. Are you vouching to defend my honor? Amber teased. He gave her a solemn nod. Absolutely. He tightened his hold on her, emphasizing his next words. No one gets to bully you, not on my watch. Amber's eyes sparkled with mischief. Well, hubby, if she tries to get under your skin, just call me in. I'll handle her for you. She beamed up at him, and he replied with a warm smile Deal. I'll head upstairs to change. Be right back. Amber made her way to the living room to catch some TV. Uncle Will, noticing Darren ascending the stairs alone, decided to follow him. Once they reached the second floor corridor, Darren sensed Uncle Will's intention to speak, so he paused and turned to face the older man. Sir, Uncle Will began, a hint of hesitance in his voice. Before you and the madam finalized your wedding plans, I came across a letter from Isabella. Darren's expression remained unreadable, betraying no emotion. I'm aware. Uncle Will continued, regret evident in his tone. 
I disposed of it, sir. Darren considered this for a moment before inquiring, Did Amber see the letter? Uncle Will was quick to respond. No, she didn't. Darren seemed relieved by this answer, but what stood out to Uncle Will was the fact that Darren wasn't angry about the discarded letter. Instead, his concern was centered around Amber. That's good, Darren finally said. Seeing Uncle Will's puzzled look, he added, You did right, Uncle Will. I just want Amber and me to have peace. With her by my side, I have everything I need. His thoughts then drifted momentarily, suggesting an unspoken wish, perhaps for a family of their own in the future. Uncle Will caught a glimpse of Darren changing his clothes in the room, a knowing smile playing on his lips. Darren's devotion to Amber was evident. All other concerns seemed trivial in comparison. When Darren and Amber arrived at the Fleming Mansion, Thomas and Bella were already in the living room, eagerly waiting for them. Ryan had been unusually well-mannered of late. Aware that Darren had brought Amber home, he chose to stay in and spend the morning with his grandparents, awaiting their return. Why'd you two take so long? Maybe you were just too worn out from last night, he teased, lounging on the couch. Amber's cheeks flushed a shade of pink as she approached Thomas and Bella. Enough, Ryan, Bella admonished him. Ryan grimaced, feeling increasingly marginalized in the Fleming household. Had it not been for Amber's pivotal role in saving his life, he would never have lingered around, waiting for a mere dinner. Dad, Mom, Amber greeted warmly, stepping beside Darren in front of the two elders. Thomas gave a subtle nod while Bella beamed at them. Amber, from this point forward, you're officially one of us. Previously, since Amber and Darren hadn't held a formal wedding banquet and without official documentation, their union wasn't considered official. If anyone gives you trouble, come to me. I'll set them straight, Bella assured, taking Amber's hand into her own. Amber nodded, recalling how Bella had stood by her side against Julie's extravagant event. I will, Mom, she replied affectionately. Bella then turned her gaze to Ryan, who was still sprawled on the sofa. Ryan, you should start calling them uncle and aunt. Ryan shot Amber a look. Sure, addressing Darren as uncle made sense, but calling Amber aunt? That was a stretch given she was even younger than him. Grandma, she's younger than me. How can I call her aunt? Ryan protested. Watch your tone, Bella retorted, clearly irritated. Ryan glanced at Darren and said, Grandma, uncle always had a thing for younger women, and now he's with someone even younger than me. And you expect me to call her aunt? As he mentioned Darren, Darren's expression soured. Of all the comments he'd heard about his and Amber's age difference, those from family hurt the most. Respect the family hierarchy, Darren said coolly. By that, he meant Ryan should address Amber as his aunt. All along, Darren was teasing him. It wouldn't hurt you to show some respect to your elders, he continued, playing with Ryan's mood. Ryan promptly sat up from the sofa. Man, you really can't cross Uncle Darren, he thought. He then served tea to Darren and Amber at Bella's request. Amber, tea for you, he said. Amber was amused by Ryan's reluctant demeanor and cheerfully accepted it. That's better, Ryan, Darren observed Amber sip her tea, then said to Ryan, You're off the hook. Ryan grimaced, realizing he'd been played by Darren. Darren's affection for Amber was undeniable. Post-wedding, the couple started planning their honeymoon, which they scheduled for Amber's winter break. Amber had a long list of destinations she wanted to visit, from tropical islands to European getaways. To make sure they'd have a carefree holiday, everything at the Fleming residence needed to be in order. The moment Darren left the mansion, Bella signaled a housekeeper to set up the rummy table. With four players available and Darren out of the picture, Bella wasn't about to miss out on a perfect opportunity for a game. Ryan had planned to use Darren's absence as a chance to head to the local gaming lounge. Grandma, I'm not really up for playing today. He tried going away. 
Bella saw through his excuse and pulled him towards the rummy table. You're playing, whether you like it or not. If you don't, don't bother calling me grandma anymore. Feeling trapped and knowing that asking Thomas for assistance would be futile, Ryan resignedly took his place at the table. With his thin wallet in his pocket, it seemed the best he could do was humor his grandmother and play a few rounds. On the other hand, just the day after Darren's grand wedding celebration, a startling piece of news emerged. Matt's renowned bar had been raided and shut down by the police on grounds of illicit operations and possible gambling ties. The shocker? It was Darren who had tipped off the authorities. This seemed impossible. Darren had always been on the straight and narrow. There was chatter suggesting that Darren had set Matt up. On that fateful day, Matt was in a hotel suite, a companion by his side when he got the call. Who had the nerve to rat me out? He demanded. It was Darren, came the reply. Matt's temper flared. Back in Michigan, he and Darren had always been close. Matt had always looked up to him. Damn it, Matt muttered, frustrated. He suspected Darren might have discovered some secret he was hiding, which led to the tip-off. Boss, what's our next move? Should we try to intervene at the police station? One of his aides asked over the phone. We can always open another bar. It's just money, Matt replied nonchalantly. After ending the call, the woman beside him, a celebrity he'd met at Darren's wedding, no longer held his interest. Time to go, he said, scribbling a check and handing it to her. She glanced at the amount, smiled, and left without another word. Alone now, Matt lit a cigarette, lost in thought. He didn't have the same dependence on nicotine as Darren. Initially, he hadn't even enjoyed smoking. After a few puffs, disliking the stale aftertaste, he stubbed the cigarette out and dialed Darren's number. Why did you have to shut down my bar this morning? Matt asked with a chuckle. Did Amber kick you out of the bed last night or something? He taunted him. Matt, you're pushing it, Darren replied, maintaining his composure. Had it not been for their long-standing relationship, Darren might have taken more drastic action than just shutting down the bar. I'm doing all this for you and Amber, Matt replied smugly. By the way, is Isabella still at your place? Matt had orchestrated the situation, delivering Isabella right to Darren's doorstep. He wanted to see who Darren would choose when confronted with his past lover and his current wife. She's gone, Darren replied coolly. Hearing this, a hint of admiration flashed in Matt's eyes. You really will stick by Amber. Darren. Darren was known for his assertiveness and clear priorities, quite opposite to Matt's character. Look, Matt, if you're bored, maybe find a new fling. Just stop meddling in Amber's and my life, Darren said. Why do you get to flaunt your happy relationship in front of someone who's still single? Matt shot back. That's on you. Darren remarked coolly. Matt felt a sting in his heart. When was the last time he'd felt this way? Just stop your games, Matt, Darren said before hanging up. Alone in his silent room, Matt stared at the plain white walls. This quietness was stifling. He was used to a wilder, louder life filled with parties, voices, and temptations. Such chaos kept his mind occupied and his emotions at bay. Slipping back into his typical nonchalance, he got dressed, planning to head out and enjoy some company. He couldn't stand idle for long. The sight of Darren and Amber's happiness was too much of a contrast to his own life. Darren and Amber were living a dream. Suzanne and Robert had reconnected, but their relationship lacked the sweetness it had seven years prior. Some relationships stand the test of time, while others drift apart. No one quite understood what had happened between them. Lately, Suzanne's nights were haunted by a memory. In her dream, she would search for Robert at their designated meeting spot, but he was nowhere to be found. Robert, Robert, she'd call out desperately, but he wouldn't answer. One night, her cries from the dream woke Robert up. 
He glanced over to see Suzanne in distress, reaching out to grasp her hand to reassure her. Suzanne, I'm right here. As her eyes fluttered open, panic still evident, she abruptly shoved the man next to her away. You're not Robert. But when she saw Robert, the very man she had pushed, now sitting startled on the bed, she froze. What's going on? Robert asked gently as he got up. Without any reproach, he enveloped her in a comforting embrace. Did you have a bad dream? He asked. I dreamt that you had left me, Suzanne murmured. Why would I ever leave you? After searching for you for seven years, why would I ever let go? Robert chuckled softly. Do you still love me like you did back then? Suzanne whispered. Without hesitation, Robert nodded. Just as much as before. He struggled with understanding the depth of his feelings. Greg's beatings should have driven a wedge between them, making him resent the Brooks family and even Suzanne. But he couldn't bring himself to feel anything but love. Robert tightened his embrace as he felt her damp forehead against his chest. I promise, Suzanne, I won't let go again. She lifted her gaze to meet his. A softness was there in her eyes. Even though she had found him again, why did she feel like he was slipping away? The recurrent dreams had left her restless. She overslept the next morning, and by the time she woke up, Robert's side of the bed was empty. The soft sound of running water indicated he was in the shower. Though she had spent the last few days by Robert's side, Suzanne felt she barely knew the man he had become, and this unfamiliarity only deepened her anxiety. The bedside phone buzzed, pulling her attention. She didn't own a phone herself, so she instantly knew it had to be Robert's. A quick glance confirmed her suspicion. Though she typically had no interest in Robert's calls, the displayed name made her pick up immediately. Hazel, the screen read. From childhood, Hazel had claimed to be Suzanne's closest friend, primarily because of her father, Mr. Ben. Hazel and Suzanne were of a similar age. In the Brooks family circle, if there was someone close to Suzanne besides Amber, it was Hazel. But who would have guessed that Hazel, with whom she shared such a tight bond, would betray her during her toughest times and even pursue the man she loved? Roby, a soft, melodic voice said from the other end once Suzanne answered. Sitting back on the bed, Suzanne responded, Sorry, I'm not your Roby. Hazel would have never dared to use such an intimate nickname for Robert in Suzanne's presence seven years ago. Regardless of how Hazel felt about Robert, she always kept her feelings hidden. Whenever she spoke to Suzanne about him, both simply referred to him as Robert. Suzanne had been completely oblivious to the fact that Hazel secretly harbored feelings for her boyfriend. Only when she was trapped by Greg and Hazel visited her did she realize that Hazel was the obstacle between her and Robert. Hazel sounded taken aback when she heard Suzanne's voice. She hadn't expected Robert to be with another woman. Who are you? Where's my Roby? Put him on! Hazel's voice, a mix of confusion and anger, pressed Suzanne. Suzanne calmly replied, taking her time. He's in the shower. This statement seemed to further infuriate Hazel. Suzanne imagined Hazel's face turning a shade redder with every word. In the shower? What are you doing there? Hazel exclaimed, her voice filled with disbelief. Hazel was well aware that Robert hadn't been with another woman for years out of loyalty to Suzanne. Could it be possible that in Suzanne's absence, another woman had captured his heart? She wondered. We shared a bed last night. Suzanne said with a hint of mischief in her voice, interrupting Hazel. In fact, we've been doing so for the past few nights. Hazel gripped the phone tighter, struggling to process Suzanne's revelation. The idea that Robert could be with another woman seemed unfathomable to her. As she replayed the conversation in her head, she recognized the familiarity of the voice. Suzanne? She asked hesitantly. Rather than confirming her identity, Suzanne simply chuckled and ended the call. 
Hazel's desperation to ascertain if it truly was Suzanne only made Suzanne more determined to keep her guessing. Toying with Hazel in this way was a small measure of payback. Predictably, Hazel's name lit up the screen as another call came through. Suzanne silenced the ringer. She anticipated Hazel would confront her soon, probably the very next day. She was mentally prepared. After all, it was Hazel who had been behind her seven-year confinement, all because of a man. And then there was the betrayal by Mr. Ben as well. They were once like family to her, but they had betrayed her repeatedly. When Robert emerged from the bathroom, Suzanne placed his phone back on the bedside table. She admired his post-shower look as he moved about the room. Despite the years and challenges, he was still undeniably handsome. If only his leg injury hadn't affected him, he'd be perfect. Over the seven years, Robert had also evolved into a more introspective and composed individual. What's up? Robert inquired, noticing Suzanne's contemplative look. Your phone rang earlier, but I silenced it. It was a bit too distracting. Suzanne grinned. Robert responded simply with, okay. Leaning in, she tapped on his chest playfully. It was Hazel who called. Tell me, over all these years, how have you truly felt about her? She asked. It's a profound thing when a woman shares significant time with a man. Even if he doesn't hold romantic feelings for her, there's bound to be some emotional connection. Suzanne. Robert's voice was gentle as he took Suzanne's hand, reassuringly adding, I've never been intimate with her. She recalled their conversation in the car not long ago. Did you ever get close with her? She had asked. He had been adamant. No, never. It was his sincere response that had allowed her to trust him again. I understand that, Suzanne said softly. But how do you feel about her? Regardless of everything, Hazel had been by Robert's side for the last seven years. To Robert, Hazel had devoted her prime years to him, even foregoing other relationships. This wasn't something he could overlook easily. Despite his deep love for Suzanne, there was a part of him that felt a pang of guilt towards Hazel, perhaps even some resentment towards Suzanne for the choices she had made. Suzanne, Hazel has been there for me all these years. I can't reciprocate her feelings and it pains me, Robert admitted, squeezing Suzanne's hand gently. Stay with me. Help me make it up to her, will you? Suzanne chuckled, shaking her head in disagreement. That's not an option. Make it up to Hazel? Who would make up to her for the seven tumultuous years she had endured? Suzanne's mood shifted, her brow furrowed, and Robert couldn't help but think of how she had awakened from a nightmare just earlier. The cheerful Suzanne by day and the haunted one by night seemed like two distinct individuals. You've changed, Suzanne, Robert observed. You wouldn't have teased me like this before. Saying this, he gently laid her on the bed, she gazed up at him, her fingers tracing the contours of his face. I love you, he whispered. She replied tenderly, Robert, you've remained loyal in action, now remain loyal in the heart. Love, in its purest form, leaves no room for others, she thought. Between her and Hazel, who was truly the outsider in this love story? She had expected Hazel to confront her the very next day, Indeed, when Hazel arrived, Suzanne and Robert were right in the middle of dinner. Hazel, luggage in tow, was announced by an assistant, Oliver, familiar with Robert's long-standing entourage. Sir, Miss Hazel has arrived. Oliver had been with Robert for years. He recognized Hazel, who had been a constant in Robert's life. Yet he had never met Suzanne before. Hazel set her luggage down by the door and quickly made her way inside. The first face she met was Robert's. Why are you here? Robert's brow furrowed upon seeing her. I came to check on mom. She's not feeling well, Hazel quickly responded, trying to find a plausible reason for her sudden visit. From the other side of the table, a soft voice caught everyone's attention. Robert, could you peel some prawns for me? 
The voice was sweet and mellifluous, warmer than Hazel's, and it seemed to tug at Robert's heartstrings. Oliver was standing behind Hazel. He leaned in and whispered, Miss Hazel, that woman has been inseparable from Mr. Robert lately. When Hazel tuned into the voice again, it struck her as eerily familiar. Moving a few steps forward, she saw Suzanne, smiling warmly in her direction. Shock rooted Hazel to the spot. Suzanne? She thought. Hadn't her mother said that Suzanne was confined to the top floor of the Brooks residence? What was she doing here? Was her ailment cured? Did Robert know about her infatuation with him? A wave of panic swept over Hazel. Her hands grew cold and her thoughts raced. She wondered if Suzanne had revealed the dark secrets from years past. If Robert knew she played a role in Suzanne's breakdown, any hope of love or even acknowledgement from him would be dashed. And some vinegar, please, Suzanne chimed in, her voice light and playful. Without any hesitation, Robert began peeling the prawns. After dipping them in vinegar, he placed them tenderly on Suzanne's plate. Suzanne ate a prawn, savoring each bite. Her eyes locked onto Hazel, who stood there, seemingly paralyzed, and her grin grew broader. Hazel, have you had dinner yet? Robert inquired. Judging by Hazel's expression, I bet she hasn't, Suzanne teased with a laugh. She must be so concerned about her health that she's lost her appetite. Hazel's unease intensified, but one thing was crystal clear to her. Suzanne was no longer the mad person from the Brooks family. She had fully recovered. Hazel couldn't understand why her mother hadn't mentioned Suzanne's recovery or that she'd left the Brooks residence. She had come to Michigan specifically to find Suzanne because she was well aware of Robert's arrival in Michigan as well. Now, with Suzanne right in front of her, she was unsure of her next move. Suzanne, she began cautiously, are you feeling better? Suzanne remained silent, but Robert's reaction was immediate, his concern evident. What happened to her? Hazel was silently relieved by Robert's response. It seemed he wasn't aware of Suzanne's confinement over the past seven years. I heard Mom mention that Suzanne caught a cold, Hazel quickly interjected before Suzanne could speak. Suzanne merely offered a smile, not bothering to clarify. Hazel pondered why Suzanne hadn't revealed her past mental health challenges. The realization struck her. What man would easily accept that his partner once struggled with mental health or that their future child might inherit similar challenges? It made sense to her. Suzanne must have been hesitant about people discovering her past struggles. Even if Robert was understanding, his family might not be so accommodating. Given his accomplishments and the esteem he held in the Martin family, they wouldn't easily endorse a union with someone they viewed as unstable. Robert, when did you reconnect with Suzanne? Hazel asked. But before Robert could answer, Suzanne interjected, Robert, I'd love some more prawns. Without hesitation, he set aside his fork and began peeling prawns for Suzanne. Suzanne had always loved prawns, though she despised peeling them. Robert, in their past together, would often do it for her. Whenever they dined, they'd typically order prawns alongside a vegetable dish. Robert expertly peeled the prawns, leaving Suzanne to enjoy her favorite dish. It was clear that even after all these years, he had retained his skill in peeling prawns, possibly even refining it over the seven years. Hazel recalled that Robert always ordered a plate of prawns every time he ate out. Once peeled, he'd simply discard them without consuming a single one. It was all for Suzanne, she finally understood. Watching Robert diligently peel prawns for Suzanne, Hazel's face turned a ghostly pale. She discreetly clenched her fist under the table, nails digging into her palm in frustration. She had arrived hastily and was yet to eat, but with Suzanne present, she found her appetite waning. Robert seemed to only have eyes for Suzanne, not even offering her any food. To Hazel, Suzanne seemed to have an almost supernatural hold over Robert. When Suzanne was absent, Robert yearned for her. When she was present, he seemed even more entranced, neglecting everything else. 
Hazel, you seem off. Hungry, perhaps? Suzanne remarked with a hint of mischief in her voice. It was only after Suzanne's comment that Robert glanced in Hazel's direction. After dinner, I'll arrange for someone to take you to your mom's, he said. Hazel was in tears. Her hopes had shattered. She'd been by Robert's side for over six years, and yet her bond with him seemed incomparable to Suzanne's, who had been absent for seven years. She had always hoped that by the age of 30, she'd be Robert's wife. But now, with Suzanne's miraculous recovery, she was right there, effortlessly capturing Robert's attention. Hazel, don't you want to leave? Suzanne teased. Didn't you mention that your mom is ill? Hazel had come hoping to discover the identity of the woman by Robert's side, not to check on her mother or Mr. Ben. Robert's suggestion that she should visit her home was something she hadn't anticipated. It's not that you can't stay, Hazel. I just worry about the noise at night disturbing your rest, Suzanne said with a teasing smile. Caught off guard by the insinuation, Hazel fumbled with her spoon and dropped it onto the table. Her teary eyes turned fierce. Unbelievable! Oliver couldn't hold back any longer and snapped at Suzanne. Suzanne merely chuckled, not bothering to respond. Robert's expression, however, turned stern. Leave, he ordered the assistant sharply. Not waiting for Oliver to react, Hazel abruptly rose. If I'm the problem, I'll leave. She was already heading for the main entrance when she heard Robert call out, Hazel. She paused, a fleeting smile breaking through her tears. But as she dabbed away the tears and turned, she heard Robert add, Your suitcase. The comment elicited a hearty laugh from Suzanne. Hazel felt crushed. She quickly retrieved her belongings from the living room and hurriedly exited Robert's home. Oliver left right behind her. Robert's gaze settled on Suzanne, who continued to chuckle. She was naturally stunning, and her laughter only added to her allure. Are you pleased with your little display? He inquired. She stopped laughing and nodded. Very much so. You were on fire tonight, he commented. She leaned in, placing a quick kiss on his cheek. However, Robert caught her wrist, preventing her from pulling away. That's it? Just a single kiss? He asked. Since when did you become so demanding, Robert? Suzanne smirked. Robert regarded Suzanne for a moment before responding. Suzanne, it's not just me who's changed. Suzanne played coy, pretending not to grasp the depth of his words. She giggled and let him pull her into an embrace, sealing it with a kiss. On the other side, Amber headed back to college right after New Year's Day. Her marriage to Darren had been the talk of Michigan. Now, back at the University of Michigan, Amber found herself the center of every conversation. There were those who admired her, some who envied her, and a few who went out of their way, arriving at her classes early just to catch a fleeting look at the new bride. Darren had made sure Amber was well protected as he sent a convoy of cars to escort her to college. Inside one of those cars, Amber peered out the window. The trailing vehicles caused her heart to race. Darren's concern was that she might be hassled or targeted, but his response seemed a tad over the top. Amber's extravagant entourage soon became the buzz on campus. Many who had merely known her as Darren's wife were now eager to know more about her. However, the spotlight wasn't to Amber's liking. Fortunately, the collective curiosity soon waned. After students got a sense of who she was and learned about her background, the fervor settled. Amber had anticipated this. Soon enough, the attention dwindled and no one was snapping pictures of her any longer. Yet college after her wedding brought its own set of challenges. During classes, she frequently encountered Stella. One day, Amber watched Stella get down from Carlos's car. To her surprise, Carlos leaned in and gave Stella a quick peck on the cheek. The sight was too much to bear, especially when she thought about Lori. Lori might have her flaws, but Stella wasn't any saint. She had, after all, come between Lori and Carlos. Stella and Carlos seemed oblivious to Amber's observation. 
After their intimate moment, Carlos climbed into his vehicle, a pleased smile adorning his face, and drove off. Carlos was truly something else, always justifying his own actions, even when they were far from righteous. He hadn't divorced Lori, and neither had he left Stella, believing he owed something to both women. As Stella entered, she caught sight of Amber. It was impossible for her not to notice Amber's entourage of bodyguards at the college. While many envied Amber, Stella harbored a deep resentment towards her. If it hadn't been for Amber, she wouldn't have fallen so hard for Carlos. In her eyes, her heart should have been set on Darren. As Stella made to leave, she heard Amber's voice. Stella. Stella was taken aback. Amber typically wouldn't even give her the time of day. Opting not to play the victim, Stella approached Amber, inquiring, What do you want? Carlos won't marry you, Amber stated. I never asked him to. Nor have I given it much thought, Stella retorted coolly. In her view, Carlos was just another man in her life. Amber wasn't taken aback by Stella's candidness. She remembered how Stella and Carlos had secretly tried to tie the knot during Amber's own wedding reception, only to be caught by Lori. Stella's ploy was clear. Disrupt Amber and Darren's wedding by creating chaos. However, Darren had swiftly handled the situation. When Lori had gone after Stella, he had his security team escort all three of them out of the hotel. Drama was welcome, just not under his roof. Recalling that event, Stella couldn't help but think how Darren had ejected her from the wedding venue. Would things have been different if Amber hadn't been in the picture? Would Darren have longed for her affection, she wondered. Amber, why do you care about Carlos and me? Are you perhaps interested in Carlos, looking to play both sides of the field? If you have a thing for Carlos, just say the word. I'll arrange a meeting, Stella scoffed. Amber found herself reassessing her. It was as if the Stella in front of her wasn't the same docile character she'd portrayed to the world. Enjoy tearing families apart, do you? Amber remarked coldly. Having watched Shannon and Lori rip her own family apart, Amber held no sympathy for those who intervened in others' relationships. Even with her strained relationship with Lori, she couldn't stomach Stella meddling between Lori and Carlos. It felt as if she was inserting herself into someone else's drama. Stella smirked. It's exhilarating. She nonchalantly reached into her pocket. If Lori was so incapable of keeping Carlos, that's on her. His interest in me? That's just a testament to my allure. Amber was taken aback. She hadn't anticipated Stella to flaunt her relationship with Carlos so brazenly. If Lori had any spine, she'd have kept Carlos tied down. Frankly, he's more of an annoyance than anything, Stella grinned devilishly. Don't assume having Darren in your corner means you can push people around, Stella spat out. The sneer disappeared, replaced by a burning jealousy in her eyes. In truth, Darren was the one Stella had always wanted by her side. What was Carlos in comparison? Being with Carlos was about flaunting a man who doted on her and showing Darren what he was missing. To her, parading around with Amber's ex fiance was a perfect revenge. Something about Stella's behavior felt off to Amber. When she spotted Carlos pulling up at the campus, she realized Stella must have called him, assuming Amber was bullying her. Carlos stepped out of the car and Stella turned to him, her eyes now glistening with crocodile tears. Her theatrics easily outpaced Lori's, who was supposedly honing her acting chops. Poor Lori was simply out of her league when up against a cunning fox like Stella. Given this, Lori was bound to face more hardships from both the Watson family and Carlos. Amber glanced at Stella, who was sobbing looking at Carlos. He was actively trying to console her. Looking at the scene, Amber decided to step away. She felt a pang of sympathy for Lori. She thought maybe she should give her a heads up about Stella's intentions. But then again, Lori had always been unkind to her. Maybe it was best for her to mind her own business and focus on living a peaceful life. As Amber walked away, she felt a mix of emotions. She had half expected Carlos to chase after her, 
much like he did with Lori whenever she confronted him. But instead, as she left with her bodyguard, she noticed Carlos watching her depart with a look of longing. Carlos, Stella said softly. Amber just implied that I'm coming between you and Lori. Do you think she might still have feelings for you? She continued gently. Should I perhaps arrange a meeting between you two? A while back, Carlos might have jumped at such an offer. But after several failed attempts to woo Amber back, all he had received from her was cold indifference. He knew where he stood with Amber. There's no need, he responded, looking down at a tearful Stella. Stella, you are all I need. Stella couldn't help but scoff internally. She had little affection for him, yet she wasn't ready to see him return to Lori either. The same day was Maze's death anniversary. With no classes scheduled for the afternoon, Amber decided to visit Maya's gravesite. Darren had expressed his desire to accompany her and pay respects to his late mother-in-law as well, but business matters with the Flemings held him back. Arriving at the cemetery, umbrella in hand, Amber approached Maya's grave. She was taken aback to find Greg sitting there. He was already deep in thought. When Suzanne was healthy, she would often bring Amber to this very spot. However, after her mental breakdown, Amber began visiting Maya's grave on her own. As a child, she once naively approached Greg to ask him about her mother, Maya. The mere mention of Maya's name seemed to trigger something in Greg, making his face darken with anger. In an instant, he roughly pushed Amber to the ground. Greg despised any mention of Maya, particularly when it came from Amber. Reflecting on her past, Amber could only think of one word that described her relationship with Greg. Contempt. He not only disliked her, but had even exploited her for the sake of advancing the Brooks' interests. Upon seeing Amber, Greg lifted his gaze. However, she chose to ignore him. She hadn't even extended an invitation to him for her wedding, so there was no reason to acknowledge him now. Kneeling beside Maya's tombstone, Amber spoke softly to her mother. She remembered how Suzanne once told her that if their mother were still around, she would never let anyone mistreat her. Growing up, Amber often felt a deep sense of envy towards her peers, who at least had one loving parent. While her mother had disappeared early in her life, her remaining father, Greg, showed more affection to Lori than her. There were numerous times after enduring harsh words and physical punishments from Greg that she wanted to confront him, asking things like, Are you truly my father? Why did other fathers dote on their daughters while she was consistently rebuked and berated by her own? To her, everything she did seemed wrong in his eyes. As she matured, she recognized Greg's blatant favoritism and overt selfishness. By the time he arranged for her to be involved with the Fleming family, Amber no longer had the heart to question him about their relationship. His coldness had numbed her spirit. What was the use of questioning their bond? Once Amber had finished her homage, Greg watched her without uttering a word. Glancing from Maya's portrait on the tombstone to Amber, he couldn't help but see the striking resemblance between mother and daughter. And with that likeness, the painful memories of Maya's perceived betrayal resurfaced. Wasn't he also wronged in some way? Why couldn't Amber see that and give him a chance to make amends? He thought. As Amber concluded her tribute, she began to walk away. Greg's voice halted her steps. Amber, he called out to her. She paused, turning her gaze slightly towards him. What do you want? She asked, her tone detached. Why don't you call me dad anymore? Greg questioned. His voice was icy. She let out a smile. Do you deserve it? Their conversations always seemed to devolve into disputes. The rare exception was that moment when Greg met her at the Watsons before her wedding, giving her some of Maya's belongings. His expression faltered and grew pale. You're right. I don't, he replied. He had offered Amber up to the Flemings as a substitute for Lori and even contemplated trading her for the advantage of the Brooks. He realized he was far from the father figure Amber deserved. 
It was no surprise that she excluded him from her wedding festivities, and he never expected an invitation either. But with the Brooks's affairs nearing an end, Greg felt a need to square things with Amber. If you don't see me as your father anymore, that's your right, Greg remarked, his voice neutral. He rose to his feet and studied Amber's profile. He hesitated and tried to gather his thoughts. Then, articulating each word deliberately, he said, Amber, I need 20 million. He left the request hanging in the air. His fist was involuntarily clenching. Amber was well informed about the Brooks' current situation. She didn't entirely believe that the Brooks were on its last leg. Just the other day, she had discussed with Darren the possibility of finding a way to rescue the Brooks. She despised Greg, but she also recognized that the family business was her mother's legacy. 20 million? Amber responded to his request with a chill in her voice, laughing sardonically. Where do you think I'd get that kind of money? She asked. For Darren, 20 million is pocket change. Amber, the family needs 20 million, he revealed. The Brooks family was on the brink of collapse, but Greg was determined not to let it go under on his watch. He didn't want the world to see the Brooks declare bankruptcy. To save the business, he had sold antiques, valuables, and nearly all his properties, retaining only his current residence. These desperate measures were a testament to his commitment to the Brooks. As a result, he constantly found himself in disagreements with Shannon and Sophia. His persistence was unwavering. For over a decade, his singular focus had been on running the Brooks successfully. However, his lack of business acumen meant the company's condition worsened under his leadership. 20 million, he asserted. Once you hand over that amount, we're done. No strings attached. She was taken aback. She glanced at him with a mix of disbelief and derision. Are you hearing yourself? She exclaimed. It was clear to her that he had wronged her countless times in the past. Yet, instead of attempting to mend their relationship, he was suggesting they sever their father-daughter bond for a price of 20 million. Amber chuckled, finding the whole situation almost laughable. She had earlier witnessed Greg shedding tears beside Maya's tombstone, which led her to believe that, deep down, he must have held some affection for Maya, and by extension, for her. After all, she was his flesh and blood. They shared a familial bond that should have meant something. But to her disbelief, the first thing Greg did was slap a price on that bond. Amber scoffed, her laughter tinged with sarcasm. Why would I pay 20 million to sever ties with you? After all the pain and betrayal he'd inflicted on her, what did their relationship even mean? In her heart, she had long since denied acknowledging him as her true father. Brushing off the interaction, she began to walk away. But Greg's next words stopped her cold in her tracks. Amber, he began, his voice filled with a strange mix of accusation and self-pity. I provided for you for two decades. Don't you think it's time to repay what you owe? Her composure was fractured by the audacity of his claim. Amber spun around, her icy glare landing on Greg. What did you just say? The chill in her eyes caused a fleeting pang of guilt in Greg, but he pressed on. Amber, I'm not your biological father, he stated coldly, each word slicing through the air like a blade. His blunt declaration felt like a physical blow, stabbing at her heart and shattering her world. You're not truly my daughter, he continued his voice dripping with bitterness as he moved closer to her. Maya had you with another man while we were together. As Greg's words hung in the air, a heavy silence ensued. Amber's disbelief was palpable. That's impossible, she snapped, rejecting his claim outright. Mom would never have cheated on you, she retorted, her voice laced with frustration. Though she had never met Maya in person and only knew her through photographs and stories, Amber believed her mother to be a strong, unwavering, and loyal woman. If Maya truly loved Greg, she would never have betrayed him, regardless of the circumstances. 
I wish I could believe that too, he replied with a sigh. But the truth is, you aren't mine. You belong to her, he said pointedly. Not to me. Greg's voice wavered with a mix of nostalgia and pain. The anguish of the past weighed heavily on him, and it was clear that the revelation about Amber not being his biological daughter had torn him apart. When you were born, I was over the moon. He began, his gaze distant. I believed that you would bridge the gap between Maya and me. I loved her deeply, and I hoped our bond would strengthen, immune to outside influences. But then I got to know about it, and I felt betrayed. He continued, his tone growing steely. I had made up my mind not to get involved with Lori or let Shannon influence me in any way. Even if the Geller family used their power against me, Greg declared with a cold edge. But why? Why would she bring another man into our lives? Anger contorted his features as he advanced towards Amber. Seeing the fury and coldness in his eyes, Amber instinctively stepped back, fear bubbling up. She had to stand her ground. My mother would never betray you. On what grounds do you even suspect her? She challenged, trying to piece together the memories of her childhood. Greg's maltreatment of her throughout the years started making sense. The derogatory term bastard that he'd often hurled at her and her sister echoed in her mind. She remembered how her elder sister had stood up to Greg, shielding Amber from his wrath, taking the brunt of his blows. Could it be true? Amber whispered to herself, her heart racing. Was I really not his child? Her conviction had been shaken. Had she been misled all these years? Amber was adamant in her belief that Maya would never betray Greg. Do you really think I'd make such claims without evidence? His voice dripped with icy disdain. How do you think I've treated you all these years, Amber? Can't you see it for yourself? A hint of triumph crossed his face as he noticed the color drain from Amber's face. You were just a child when Maya passed, he recalled, his voice heavy with emotion. Do you have any idea what I did right after I came back from the hospital to the Brooks residence? He paused for emphasis. I abandoned you. That's right. I left you. The horror in Amber's eyes only deepened and Greg's laugh, tinged with bitterness, echoed eerily. Had it not been for Suzanne, who trailed me and brought you back, you might not have even survived. If Suzanne hadn't leveraged herself, using threats to ensure you stayed in the Brooks household, you might have ended up in some foster home. The weight of Greg's words bore down on Amber. She'd always sensed a difference in his treatment towards her, but she'd never delved too deep into her suspicions. The reality of her parentage was unclear. Lori always had Greg's affection, receiving his love and care. In stark contrast, Amber had faced his cruelty, often leading her to question whether he was truly her father. Do you honestly think that if you were my flesh and blood, I'd have let you forsake Carlos to be with the Flemings? Greg taunted. Back then, I deemed Darren to be below our standards. Still, I ruthlessly pressured you, using Suzanne as a pawn. As a father, it pains me to see my child suffer. I kept Suzanne around all these years, not wanting her to endure what Maya had. I let Lori marry Carlos, her love. But you? He paused, his eyes cold. You just happened to be at the right place at the right time, Greg sneered. Do you still hold on to the idea that I could be your father? Amber didn't need any more clarity. Two decades of doubt and the weight of Greg's admissions made her rethink everything she once believed. Greg stared at her, noting her shock and disbelief. Unrelenting, he continued to pour out the bitter truth. If you're with Darren, I couldn't care less if you're happy or miserable. I just want to use you to gain leverage with him. If Darren pulls his funds, I'd have no qualms about passing you on to someone else. Do you honestly believe a real father would do that to his own flesh and blood? Enough! Amber's voice cracked, overwhelmed with emotion, her eyes brimming with tears. Just stop. 
Just stop it. The bitter truths crushed her spirit. She had been living a lie. The man she had called father for so long wasn't her real dad. And worse, he had manipulated her throughout her life. Greg gazed at the distraught Amber, struggling with his own emotions. He tried convincing himself, she's not my child. She's Maya's with another man. After providing for her all these years, he felt it was only right that she should compensate him now. Do you believe me now? He asked coldly. Amber fought back tears and looked at him. You're truly heartless. So cruel. Her voice was quivering. Even if she wasn't his own, she was still the daughter of the woman he once loved. Why was he so callous? What had she done to deserve this? Amber, I want twenty million dollars, he said, composing himself. A defiant sneer curved Amber's lips. Not a dime. Forget it now. If you're not my father, why should I get Darren to part with his money for you? Why should I owe you anything? She shot back, her gaze piercing his. Why, you ask? He replied coldly. I've taken care of you for twenty years. You've lived under my roof and eaten my food. Don't I deserve some kind of repayment? Don't you have any conscience? He asked. Conscience? Amber exclaimed. How can you speak of conscience when you've shown none towards me? She gave a disdainful snort. As she was about to turn on her heel and depart, a cold, familiar voice resonated from nearby. How much are you asking for? In their heated exchange, both Amber and Greg had failed to notice Darren approaching from a distance. Darren had heard every biting word Greg had thrown at Amber. As Amber saw him, her brave face struggled to hold back tears. To think that Amber, his dear wife, had been treated this way by the man she had considered her father was abominable. Greg's face blanched slightly upon seeing Darren's frosty expression. Mr. Darren, he acknowledged, trying to mask his unease. Without uttering a word, Darren closed the gap between himself and Amber. Gently, he reached out to hold her hand, which was cold from tension. He tightened his grip, trying to lend her warmth and reassurance. Twenty million, correct? Darren questioned his tone level. Greg noticed his evident care for Amber. He momentarily thought that while Amber's life in the Brooks family might have been challenging, fate had been kind in granting her a caring husband like Darren. Seeing a potential advantage, Greg's greed flared. Make it forty million, he said. Amber's cold laughter sliced through the tension. She met Greg's gaze, her eyes filled with revulsion. Actually, she spoke on Darren's behalf, her tone dripping with sarcasm. You won't be seeing a single cent. Greg's eyes narrowed, but he didn't lose his composure. He turned to Darren, attempting to exploit any potential cracks in their relationship. Is Amber's worth to you less than 40 million? You're a man of high status, surrounded by younger, eager women. As years go by, where will Amber stand in your heart? Amber's grip on Darren's hand tightened further and she jumped in before he could reply. Greg, your transparent attempts to drive a wedge between us are laughable. Do you honestly believe that all men are as despicable as you? To abandon the mother of their child for a wealthier, prettier woman? Greg's face reddened in fury. I did no such thing. I never once considered leaving Maya and the thought of betraying her never crossed my mind. His voice dropped, filled with emotion. I was set up. His mind raced back to the single, regrettable night with Shannon, orchestrated by outside forces. His guilt regarding that night had been overwhelming, leading him to distance himself from Shannon and be more attentive to Maya out of fear she'd discover his indiscretion. To Greg's horror, Shannon soon announced her pregnancy. His primary fear was how Maya, with her intolerance for betrayal, would react. I loved your mother, he stressed, a note of desperation creeping into his voice. Amber's laugh was cold and devoid of any amusement. Did you now? You claim I lived under your roof, ate your food, and shared your home for 20 years, she retorted, her voice dripping with sarcasm. 
And yet, in your eyes, I'm not worth 40 million. Your price tag is too steep. Do you think Darren's going to hand over 40 million to you? Dream on. Her voice took on an icy tone. At best, I'm worth 5 million to you. But let me be clear, Greg, you won't get a single penny, not a dime. She was on the verge of tears, her body quivering with emotion. If it weren't for Darren's reassuring grip on her hand, she felt she might have collapsed. Darren gazed at Amber and his heart broke at her distress. Amber, he began, his voice filled with tenderness. He had intended to handle the financial discussions with Greg himself, but realized Amber needed to confront the man herself. Let's go home, she whispered, seeking solace in Darren's embrace. Seeing the vulnerability in Amber's demeanor, Greg made one last plea. Amber, for the sake of your mother, can you spare 20 million? I can't let the Brooks legacy, which was built on her hard work, just crumble. Without Maya, the Brooks name would mean nothing in Michigan. Amber paused, taking a moment to gather herself. Though she was well aware of her mother's contributions, Maya's passing had severed any emotional ties she felt to the Brooks legacy. She took a deep breath and, without turning to face him, spoke in a tone that brooked no argument. Greg, you keep harping on about your love for my mother, yet you stand here near her final resting place, demanding money from her grieving daughter. Do you not fear that she'll rise from her grave to hold you accountable? With that, she walked away, Darren by her side. The skies had cleared and the earlier drizzle had ceased. Greg stood solemnly by the gravesite, gazing at Maya's smiling portrait etched into the tombstone. Maya, I asked Amber for 20 million for the sake of the Brooks legacy. He whispered to the wind, hoping for some form of understanding. You'd understand my reasons, right? Deep down, he was aware of Maya's disdain for him. Her final words to him were a plea to care for her daughter. While he had heeded her wishes concerning Suzanne, he had not extended the same kindness to Amber. He rationalized it, telling himself that it was easier to care for a child who wasn't biologically related to another man. On the other hand, as Amber and Darren got in the car, the atmosphere was thick with tension. Amber sat in the back, lost in her thoughts. Sensing her turmoil, Darren reached out, intertwining their fingers and offering silent comfort. He had already suspected Greg wasn't Amber's real father. The signs were evident, from the way Amber was treated at the Brooks residence to the cruel incidents she had endured there. No real father would watch his daughter suffer without intervening. Hubby, Amber whispered, seeking solace in Darren's embrace. I feel so cold. Understanding her deeper meaning, Darren motioned to the driver to adjust the car's temperature. But he knew it wasn't a physical coldness Amber was experiencing. It was a deep-seated chill in her heart. Why would he treat me this way? She lamented. Even if I'm not his own flesh and blood, does that justify his cruelty? He's been a part of my life for two decades. Surely there must have been some affection, some bond. I take care of Duke, and yet I can't bear to see him hurt. Does Greg value me less than a mere dog? She asked while crying. Amber, Darren murmured, his voice full of compassion. Whatever happens, know this. I'm with you, always. He wasn't one for grand declarations of love, but when he spoke, his sincerity was palpable. Amber didn't respond immediately and pulled Darren closer to her. Hold me tighter, hubby. I still feel cold, she whispered. The damp trails of tears stained her cheeks. Darren tightened his embrace and gently kissed her forehead. I'm right here. You're safe with me. His reassuring words filled her with warmth. In him, she found her anchor. As she gazed up at Darren, her eyes glistening with tears, she could see the concern reflected in his gaze. A small smile broke through her sadness. I'm so grateful we found each other she said. Had it not been for Darren's unwavering support, the revelation about her relationship with Greg would have shattered her. 
but Darren's promise, I'm here, don't be afraid, made her feel grounded. She had someone on her side no matter what. Lost in these thoughts, Amber gently wiped away her tears and sat up to face Darren more directly. I won't let myself be sad anymore, she declared. Why waste her energy on someone as cold-hearted as Greg when she had the love and support of Darren? Her attempt to feel good was because of him. Darren caressed her face and responded softly, Sweetheart, you don't need to hide your pain. There's no need to bottle up your feelings or pretend everything's okay for my sake. I just want you to genuinely feel content. Let it all out. Afterward, we'll go grab some comfort food, all right? Hearing this, Amber's tears flowed freely again. But this time, they were not only for the pain of her past, but also for the gratitude and love she felt towards him. She had been through a lot, especially being let down by Greg repeatedly. But she was also fortunate to have met a man as caring as Darren. As he tried to console her, Amber found solace in his embrace. Tears dampened his suit. When her tears finally subsided, a newfound clarity took over. She looked up and said, Hubby, I'm in the mood for some Italian tonight. Darren looked a bit surprised. He expected her to say something else. He had been ready to offer more words of comfort. Why don't you spoil me with a nice dinner? She teased, half seriously, wondering if Darren might turn on his earlier promise of comfort food. His smile widened, observing her teary eyes. She had this ability to find joy even in her pain, and it was infectious. His moments with Amber were filled with this unexpected happiness, like a jolt of energy that drew him closer to her. Of course, he chuckled. He was usually so reserved, not one to wear his emotions openly. But with Amber, his smiles seemed to come effortlessly. On the other hand, despite the attention he got, Amber knew he was wholly hers. Gazing into his eyes, she leaned in, bridging the small distance between them with a gentle kiss. True to his word, in the evening, Darren took her to one of Michigan's renowned Italian restaurants. While browsing the menu, Amber's eyes wandered to the dessert section, but it was the wine list that truly captured her attention. I'd like this bottle of red wine, she said, glancing sideways at Darren. He gave no verbal response, but his silence was all the affirmation she needed. Amber grinned, passing the menu back to the server. With a bottle of red wine on the way, her spirits were already lifted. She was someone who appreciated the simple pleasures. A good meal and a glass of wine were often all it took to brighten her mood. If someone showed her kindness, she'd return it twofold. Her needs were simple and her happiness came easily. Darren was aware of Amber's penchant for wine, especially since she had recently enjoyed a bottle from Matt. It amused him that she was already looking forward to the next one. He had no qualms about Amber indulging in her little pleasures, especially when he was around to ensure she was safe. But the idea of her sharing a meal and drinks with someone else? That would ruffle his feathers. It wasn't about control, but rather concern for her well-being. As they waited for their steak and wine, Amber started checking her phone. Darren, meanwhile, was internally thinking about how to handle the Greg situation for her. If Greg couldn't accept Amber as his daughter, then he would ensure Greg wouldn't bother them again. Anyone who hurt Amber would be answerable to him, even if that person were her biological father. But honestly, what kind of real father exploits his daughter the way Greg did? Demanding 40 million for raising her? It was outrageous for Darren. If Greg had treated Amber right, he might have even considered assisting the Brooks. But now it wasn't even a possibility. As Darren contemplated how to handle the issues with Greg, he instinctively reached for his pack of cigarettes. As he struck a match, his gaze settled on Amber. She was engrossed in her phone. He suddenly remembered Bella's words. Darren, when are you two planning on having kids? You know, if you have kids, you can't smoke around Amber. Bella seemed eager for them to start a family. 
Darren believed in letting things happen naturally, so he hadn't been overly cautious with Amber lately. However, he knew he had to quit smoking, for his sake and for the future of their family. Before they even thought about kids, he needed to cut back, prioritizing Amber's and a potential child's health. Amber glanced up and noticed Darren putting the unlit cigarette back into the pack. He was fond of smoking, but she rarely commented on it. She understood the grip of a long-standing habit. Hubby, are you giving up smoking? She inquired. He nodded. I'm planning on quitting soon. He moved the pack of cigarettes further away. Why? She asked, genuinely curious. Instead of answering, he simply looked at her and smiled softly. It's going to be tough for you to quit, she remarked, noting his reduced consumption recently. But if you choose not to smoke, it's better for your health, she added. I know, Darren responded. His affectionate gaze caused Amber's heart to race and cheeks to flush. The intensity of his stare always made her feel as if she could devour him. Hubby, stop looking at me like that, she said her face glowing a deeper shade of red. He chuckled. If I'm not looking at you, then who else would I be looking at? His tender remark sent Amber's heart racing even faster. Unable to resist, she slid over to sit beside him. Hubby, you should only have eyes for me. She leaned in, whispering playfully into Darren's ear before giving a light breath. The heat in his eyes intensified as he looked back at her. Now's not the time for teasing, he murmured, pulling Amber into a gentle embrace. Or else what? She blushed and gently pushed him back. Observing Amber's rosy cheeks, he found himself reevaluating the idea of dinner. He wished he could just whisk her away to a hotel suite to save himself from her playful torment. Their affection for each other was palpable, making it evident to any onlooker just how smitten they were. As the red wine was brought to the table, Amber's eyes sparkled with excitement. She was so captivated by the bottle that she barely acknowledged the waiter. Would you like me to open that for you? The waiter inquired. Lifting her gaze to respond, Amber's words were caught in her throat upon recognizing the face before her. Both Amber and Darren registered their mutual shock. The waiter standing before them was Isabella. Isabella! Amber exclaimed, an uneasy feeling creeping up on her. Could it be a mere coincidence that she worked here? Darren, while Amber had called out Isabella's name, Isabella's attention was firmly on Darren as she uttered his. What a coincidence, she remarked, her smile tinged with sadness. Continuing her professional demeanor, Isabella deftly uncorked the wine for them. Enjoy your evening? she said before making a graceful exit. Amber turned to Darren, eyebrows knitted in confusion. Why is she working here? She couldn't help but notice a stark contrast between this version of Isabella and the one she had previously encountered at the Flemings. Back then, every word out of Isabella's mouth revolved around Darren. But now, working diligently, Isabella treated them like any other customer. Has she moved on? Is she no longer fixated on you? Amber pondered aloud. Still, something didn't sit right with her. Silently, Darren poured a glass of wine for Amber. Your order is ready. Enjoy. As they waited, Isabella brought their steaks. Isabella! Darren called out as she began to leave. Why are you here? He had given her $200,000, expecting her to leave Michigan and start afresh. In his eyes, staying in Michigan was not in her best interest. As I mentioned before, I didn't know where else to go, Isabella responded with an indifferent tone. So, I found a job here in Michigan. She glanced at Amber, who was digging into her stake. I'm not shadowing you two. How could I have known you'd dine here today? Her logic made sense. Darren and Amber's decision to dine at this particular place was spontaneous, and Isabella was likely unaware. Darren, all I want is for you to be happy. That alone will bring me peace, she confessed. 
Amber was touched by her words and lost her appetite momentarily. If you truly wish for Darren's happiness, then why linger around us? She questioned, her tone sharp. Her patience was thin for someone who had relentlessly pursued her husband. Caught off guard, Isabella's eyes welled up. She uttered a soft sorry before turning away. But as she did, a smirk hinted at her lips. Typically, Amber would bristle at such provocations. But when Isabella paused at a corner to sneak a glance back, she saw a relaxed scene. Darren was attentively cutting Amber's steak, and the two of them chatted amicably, seemingly unbothered by her presence. Isabella's expression hardened looking at Amber and Darren. Her grip was firm as she clenched her fists. Soon, her phone buzzed from her pocket. Pulling it out, she answered, Hello? What's happening? Julie inquired. Isabella's gaze rested on Darren and Amber as they were sharing a lighthearted moment. A bitter smile formed on her lips. They're dining. I'm pretty sure I'll be let go from this place soon, she added casually. Isn't that a good thing? Julie remarked, unsurprised. Given how protectively Darren was acting around Amber and with Isabella continually inserting herself in the mix, Julie figured Darren would want Isabella out of the picture. I handed you an opportunity on a silver platter to reconnect with Darren. It's the perfect setup for another tragic love saga, Julie said with a sardonic chuckle. She had never really seen Isabella as a strong contender. Isabella had chosen to remain in Michigan as she dreaded going back to her own life. She was all too aware of the kind of man Darren was. Given his commitment to Amber, he wasn't the type to easily divorce. Breaking into their marital sphere would be challenging, let alone reigniting any old flames with Darren. But she wasn't ready to sit back and watch the couple bask in happiness. After investing so many years in pining for him, how could he fall for someone else? She thought. She'd become their shadow, persistently lingering around, making their lives uncomfortable. Her ultimate goal was to drive a wedge between them and separate them. If that happened, she'd step in, offer her consolation to Darren, and hope to rekindle what they once shared. Holding onto her phone, Isabella cast a final, icy glance towards the couple enjoying their meal. A sardonic smile played at the corners of her lips. On the other hand, Darren and Amber made a silent agreement to put the awkward encounter with Isabella behind them. They had come to enjoy their dinner, not stir up trouble. As long as she kept her distance, Amber didn't see the need to engage. By the end of the meal, Amber had consumed a significant amount of red wine. Miss Amber, are you okay? Isabella's voice whispered close by. She seemed to have approached at just the right moment. Miss Amber? At hearing this, Amber pushed Isabella away. She lost her balance and tumbled to the floor. Miss Amber, it seems you've had a bit too much to drink, Isabella remarked, now on the ground after Amber's shove. While Isabella's intentions appeared genuine, to the onlookers, it seemed as though Amber had inexplicably lashed out. Amber was trying to regain her composure and sneered at Isabella, who was picking herself up. Darren quickly moved to Amber's side, catching her as she fell into his arms. Hubby, she called me Miss Amber. I hate that name. She's doing it on purpose, trying to get between us. She is purposely pretending to be a waitress just to get close to you, Amber accused from the safety of Darren's arms. Turning her glare back to Isabella, she snapped, Save yourself the effort. My husband isn't interested in someone like you. She found even the harshest of insults inadequate for Isabella. Supporting Amber, Darren turned to Isabella, his voice icy. Mrs. Fleming, he corrected. If I hear you call her Miss Amber again, there will be consequences. She's my wife, Mrs. Fleming. His cold tone surprised even Isabella. She tried to defend herself. I'm just not used to her being Mrs. Fleming, so I mistakenly... Before she could finish, Amber lunged, hand raised, aiming for Isabella's face. Fueled by the wine and her husband's support, she was ready to make her point. Isabella, call me Miss Amber one more time, 
and you'll regret it, she said and slapped Isabella's face. <laughs> Isabella held her cheek and tears started to stream down her face. She looked pleadingly at Darren, trying to hold back her sobs. However, he moved without hesitation, wrapping Amber in a comforting embrace. Amber, he murmured. Amber nestled closer, taking refuge in his arms. Darren, why did she think she could just hit someone like that? Isabella protested, trying to gain some sympathy. She's had too much to drink, Darren said simply, still cradling Amber. His words implied that regardless of Amber's actions, her drunken state was the explanation. So even if Isabella ended up with a slap on her face, it was because Amber wasn't in her right mind. Isabella moved to block Amber's path and locked eyes with her. Annoyed and still intoxicated, Amber moved as if to strike her again. Isabella took a few steps back to defend her. Anger was building within her. She contemplated retaliating, but a stern look from Darren held her back. Ultimately, all she could do was watch as he gently guided Amber out of the dining area. She seethed internally. Why did Amber get to act this way? Why did Darren seem to have forgotten their past? She was enraged. Fueled by their behavior, she was even more determined to team up with Julie and ensure that Darren and Amber's days were anything but easy. Meanwhile, Darren assisted Amber out of the hotel, and as the cool night air hit, Amber shivered. Drunkenly, she burrowed further into his hold. There was a warmth in his embrace that made her hold on even tighter, not wanting to let go. Amber, you're squeezing so tight I can barely breathe, Darren chuckled softly. Blinking slowly, she looked up at him. Her face was flushed and the scent of wine hung in the air around her. Knowing Amber as he did, Darren was aware that a bottle of wine wouldn't typically leave her this disoriented, and she hadn't consumed more than that. Amber did not want to see Isabella walk all over her and cause a scene, so she used her own intoxicated state as an excuse to slap Isabella. Sweetheart, Amber began, seeking Darren's eyes. Are you mad at me? She whispered, guilt evident in her voice. A bit? Darren replied, trying to maintain a stern expression, but seeing her genuine concern, he cracked a smile. Why would I be mad at you? I thought you were upset because I pretended to be drunk and slapped her, Amber responded. Reaching up, she tiptoed to wrap her arms around Darren's neck. She was beaming. Darren gazed down at the gleeful Amber, finding it hard to even fake annoyance. Even if Isabella had any tricks up her sleeve, he saw right through them. His loyalty was unwavering to Amber. Amber caught that affectionate glint in Darren's eyes and declared, I always knew you were my biggest supporter. She then planted a quick peck on his cheek. The lingering aroma of wine from her made Darren's senses tingle. Pulling her closer, he murmured, Amber, you always keep me on my toes. Feeling his intense gaze, Amber's heart raced and a blush crept up her cheeks. Darren, she protested playfully, trying to wriggle free, but his grip was firm. You always keep me guessing, he remarked, remembering how she had flirted with him during dinner to the point he lost his appetite. Now that we're alone, shouldn't we pick up where we left off? Under the starry sky, he pulled Amber into a tender embrace on a quiet street corner, he softly pressed his lips to hers. The Darren of the past would never have been so bold in public. But with her, all his reservations were forgotten. All he could focus on was the love and affection he felt for the woman in his arms. After sharing a passionate kiss, he pulled back slightly, a playful smile playing on his lips as he looked at a slightly breathless Amber. Let's head home, he suggested. As they walked towards their car, their fingers interlaced. Amber cast her gaze downward, noting their intermingling shadows illuminated by the streetlights. She then looked up at Darren, whose presence felt like a protective barrier from all of life's hardships, filling her with happiness and warmth. She cherished the thought of their hands intertwined for a lifetime, dreaming of building a family and sharing endless joy together. 
Upon arriving at the Fleming residence, there was an unspoken mutual understanding between them, and they headed straight to their room. Darren had thought about giving Amber a gentle massage earlier that evening at the restaurant. They went to their room, changed their clothes, and got ready for bed. Darren gently pushed Amber onto the bed and leaned down to kiss her. With a playful shove, Amber pinned him down. She leaned in close and whispered, I want to start a family with you. Darren's heart warmed further. He felt lighter imagining the future. What was that you mentioned just now? He teasingly asked. Didn't you hear me the first time? You're just trying to make me repeat it. Amber feigned frustration. Maybe, he admitted. His voice dropped to a sultry whisper. But I thought I heard something about you wanting to have our child. And how many would that be? A daughter? A son? Or both? His playful inquisition made Amber's cheeks flush. In mock protest, she retorted, Now I'm not so sure. But think about it, she continued, her voice softened. A little family of ours, even if they turn out to be mischievous little pigs. Darren's eyes shimmered with affection as he took in Amber's playful defiance. Every time I look at you, he began, tracing the contours of her face, I'm reminded of how incredibly fortunate I am to have you in my life. Emotionally charged, Amber leaned in, kissing him intensely. The desire to start a family was a shared dream between them. Amber often found herself daydreaming about their potential offspring, wondering if they would have a boy or a girl. These thoughts filled her with joy and anticipation. She felt secure in her future, knowing she had Darren by her side. His love wasn't just words or fleeting moments, it was a promise. He constantly made efforts to ensure that she lived a life free of stress and worries. And true to form, he had, in many ways, already made this a reality for her. His primary goal now was to shield her from any disturbances or shadows from her past, particularly those involving Greg. While Amber had been silent about Greg's actions, Darren knew all too well the pain she must be feeling. Whether or not Greg was her biological father was irrelevant. She had grown up in the Brooks household, acknowledging Greg as her dad. To then discover his deceptions and manipulations was heartbreaking. Determined to confront the issue, Darren mobilized his associates and set out for the Brooks residence, keeping his intentions close to his chest. Greg was deep in discussion with Shannon about the Brooks family's financial woes, and Sophia was there too. Sophia was concerned that Greg might mortgage everything the family owned, including the home where Jordan currently resided. Greg had recently purchased a house for his mother. To everyone's surprise, Bonnie had moved in without hesitation. She had ambitious plans of eventually transferring the home's ownership from Greg to Sophia and later on to Jordan. Bonnie's scheme was well thought out, but before it could come to fruition, the Brooks' financial state was already deteriorating. Greg was in desperation, and he soon began liquidating his assets, hoping to salvage what was left of the Brooks' legacy. Despite Bonnie's and Sophia's considerable wealth, they couldn't afford the residence Greg had bought for them. Embarrassed about her recent interactions with Stella, Bonnie chose to lay low and let Sophia manage the household. Darren soon reached the Brook residence to meet Greg. As he approached, Sophia was engrossed in a TV show in the living room. Suddenly, Mr. Ben burst into the room, clearly agitated. Shannon shot him a disapproving look. What's got you so worked up? She asked. Just as Greg, finishing up his phone call, turned to see what the commotion was about, a familiar presence entered the grand foyer of the Brooks residence. It wasn't just Darren. A whole entourage trailed behind him. Were they here to confront the Brooks family again? Greg wondered. The sight of Darren made Greg and Shannon's blood run cold. They couldn't shake off the memory of Darren's previous visit where Lori had been on the receiving end of his wrath. Mr. Darren, Greg greeted, trying to maintain a semblance of composure. His eyes darted around, searching for another familiar face. But while there were several men accompanying Darren, Amber was conspicuously absent. 
Where's Amber? Greg inquired, a hint of concern in his voice. Without a word, Darren casually made his way over to a couch and settled down, letting the tension in the room grow. Sophia was lounging on the sofa when Darren walked in. The intensity emanating from him made her immediately get up, essentially offering her seat to him. She couldn't help but think how such a formidable man ended up being Amber's husband. She felt a pang of jealousy as she wished for Stella to end up with someone like Darren. In her eyes, Stella was superior to Amber, who she believed was just a child born from an extramarital affair. I have a lawyer with me, Darren called out, gesturing to the attorney following him. Stepping forward, the lawyer presented an agreement to Greg. Mr. Greg, we would like you to sign this, he stated. As Greg received the contract, Darren casually pulled out a cigarette and lit it. A moment later, a joyful smile spread across his face as he recalled Amber's desire to start a family with him. Crushing the cigarette, he decided he'd quit smoking at least until after Amber gave birth. Meanwhile, Greg was taken aback by the contents of the agreement. Shannon, peering over his shoulder, quickly discerned its intent. Amber wants to legally sever her father-daughter relationship with you, she exclaimed in disbelief. Sophia was ever quick to jump in the middle, so she chimed in. That ungrateful child is trying to cut ties with you. Shannon was also seething. You did so much for her, hubby, and this is how she repays you? By marrying into high society and then trying to erase her past? She taunted. Sophia nodded in agreement. Even if she isn't biologically yours, you've been her father figure for years. Now that she's entered the elite circles, she's eager to disassociate from the struggling Brooks family. However, the truth was different. It wasn't Amber who'd initiated the legal process to cut ties. Greg had planned to extract 40 million from Amber, viewing it as compensation for raising her. The sum was outrageous, considering he hadn't even spent a fraction of that on her over the years. Amber's audacity knows no bounds, Shannon muttered. Marrying was one thing, but bringing a lawyer to break the father-daughter bond? That's cold. She attempted to provoke Greg, who appeared shell-shocked upon reading the terms of the agreement. Memories of his conversation with Amber near Maya's grave came flooding back. Is this really what Amber wants? He finally asked, seeking clarity, his eyes lifting to meet Darren's stoic face. Darren replied icily, what's your take on it? Despite Amber not being his biological daughter and despite his reservations about her, Greg felt a pang of regret and sorrow seeing the terms of separation in black and white. I won't sign it he declared firmly. Darren's smirk was filled with contempt. Pretending to be the heartbroken father now, are we? After all the times you pushed her away? I'll handle the signing, he announced, sounding almost bored. Surveying the room, Shannon noted the entourage accompanying Darren. She recognized Darren's tactic, using his extensive resources and powerful family ties to pressure Greg into terminating the contract. If you're so keen on erasing her past with the Brooks, go ahead, she challenged. Darren merely glanced at Greg, thinking how the couple echoed each other's sentiments perfectly. Without missing a beat, Sophia jumped in. Amber might not be my son's biological child, but we've looked after her for years. How can we even begin to calculate the expenses involved? Sophia, having gathered some information on Darren's financial standing through Bonnie, tried to play her cards right. Since you're married to Amber, it seems only fair that you cover some of her upbringing costs. Children are expensive, and Amber had her own fair share of expenses. It's only right that you owe us a significant sum. Her voice quivered with greed as she mentioned the potential windfall. Just a few million? Darren responded with a cold chuckle, fixing his gaze on Sophia, whose face showed a mix of desperation and determination. Do you really think my wife, Amber, is only worth a couple million? Sophia caught the undertone immediately, locking eyes with Darren. To me, Amber is invaluable, he continued. While he could easily spend his entire fortune on Amber, 
He had no intention of frivolously handing out millions to them. He knew well that if he did, the Brooks family would squabble over it until they were left with nothing. It reminded him of his dealings with Lori and Carlos. He'd waited for the right moment to reveal Lori's dark secrets and the fact that he had set up Amber so he could save her watching Carlos's reaction. The same strategy applied to the Brooks family. Forty million dollars, Darren declared nonchalantly, a smirk playing at the corners of his lips as he looked at Greg. Sign the contract, and it's yours. Once signed, Amber will be completely severed from the Brooks family. She'll no longer be your daughter, Mr. Greg. Darren's statement left Greg reeling. It mirrored the deal proposed by the graveside of Maya. Wasn't 40 million what he'd been after? Yet, now that it was within his grasp, doubt crept in. Upon signing, Amber would be forever out of his life. But to Shannon and Sophia, Darren's offer was nothing short of a godsend. $40 million was a life-changing amount. It was like winning the lottery. With the Brooks family's financial security hanging by a thread, Shannon had been filled with anxiety. If their fortunes collapsed, how would she provide for Lori? Lori had always led a life of luxury and wasn't built for hardship. Thanks to past rifts, the Watson family wasn't supportive of Lori, except for the occasional financial aid. With 40 million in hand, even if the Brooks fortune crumbled, Shannon and Lori would be set for life. Sophia's sentiments mirrored Shannon's. The comforts of their current life hinged on Greg's fortune. Without it, she knew she'd be ousted from the luxurious villa and forced back into a harder, more challenging existence. The memories of her less opulent days haunted her, and she wasn't eager to return to them. So when Bonnie pitched the idea of introducing Stella to Darren, she was all for it. She believed that if Stella ended up with Darren, she'd surely have a brighter future. She nudged Greg, who seemed lost in thought. Greg, just sign it already. Once Greg pocketed the 40 million, she expected a hefty cut, at least 20 million. After all, she was his mother. He owed her that much. Shannon, too, nudged the still-shocked Greg, reminding him, Hubby, think about it. 40 million. Go on, sign it. Yet Greg stood motionless, the contract staring back at him. One of Darren's associates offered him a pen, but he made no move to take it. I won't sign, he declared firmly. To the onlookers, it appeared as if Darren was coercing Greg into cutting ties with Amber. But Darren hardly batted an eye at Greg's refusal. After all, it was Greg who craved the cash, not him. He wanted the contract signed, ensuring Greg's permanent estrangement from Amber. Sophia couldn't contain her frustration with Greg's stubbornness. Are you out of your mind? She snapped. Amber isn't your biological daughter anyway. Just sign and put an end to it all. Why stall? Sign and collect your money? Both Sophia and Shannon were growing impatient. Upon hearing Sophia's blunt reminder about Amber's lineage, Shannon's demeanor shifted. Gaining her composure, she urged, Greg, listen to your mother. The Brooks family is in crisis. This money can salvage what's left. Though Shannon voiced that sentiment, she had no intention of letting Greg pour his newfound wealth into saving the Brooks family business. The Brooks estate was Maya's legacy. She'd poured her heart and soul into building it. Facing the current financial upheaval, almost all assets were on the verge of being liquidated. Shannon was convinced that even if the Brooks legacy was salvaged, Greg wouldn't leave any of it to her. In her mind, pocketing the 40 million was the ultimate goal. Bring Amber here. I want to hear it from her, Greg demanded, refusing to budge. He needed to see Amber, to ask her directly. After all the years he'd raised her, he couldn't believe she'd treat him this way. 